Hi, welcome back to uh, writing a Deadlands TV show. This is episode three of the show, episode four of the actual series. And uh, so if you haven't seen the previous episodes, you might want to go ahead and stop and go mosey on over there and take a little bit of a gander over there. So yeah, without further ado, let's just jump right into it. Just another friendly reminder that this is part three of a series. If you've not seen part one or part two, I do highly recommend going back and watching those. All right, uh, with that out of the way, I'm going to call this episode The Deadlands. We are going to open on a flickering fire alone in the middle of the open wilderness. A man sits there, warming his hands against the fire. We see his breath in the cold. In the distance, we hear the howl of a wolf. The man draws three cards from a deck and lays them in front of him. He starts to play a card game with himself. We hear the howling of a wolf, louder this time. He looks up and turns to face the sound. For the first time, we can see that it's a younger John Weber. Text appears on the screen that says 11 years ago. John hears footsteps around his camp. He carefully picks his cards up and shuffles them. He stands up just as a werewolf lumbers into the firelight. Its fur is black as night and it snarls as he stalks John. Blood drips from an open wound on the beast's stomach. We can see the creature's red eyes reflecting the firelight. John says, there is an odd sight. Are you in control of yourself? The beast snarls and charges at John. He pulls out a card and bathes the creature in green light. We see it transform into Christine. She's naked, and the wound on her stomach is still there. John stands, and Christine backs away warily, clutching the wound. John holds out a calming hand and gives her his duster. He says, I'm the friendly sword. You can relax. Christine says, I was going to kill you. You saved me from that. Thank you. John says, I did it for entirely selfish reasons, so don't thank me. I'm John Weber. And she says, Christine Moon. John says, Moon. A bit on the nose. And she says, it's a family name. He asks her if he's got that family looking for her, and she says no. John says, well, I got an extra set of clothes, not exactly your size, but it'll do, and you're welcome to them and the fire. I know what it's like to be alone out here. You can travel with me, at least for a while. Christine says, why are you helping me? And John says, because I know what it's like to hide yourself. You're the first I've met in a long time who's like me. I reckon you'll make for good company. He tells her that he's got some bandages that he can uh, use to bandage up her wound. Uh, she tells him that she won't need it because she heals quickly under the moon. John then asks her what could do something like that to her. And she says, I don't remember. I never do. Just the vague outlines of emotions. I only remember fear. We're going to cut to 11 years later. Uh, we're going to see John and Christine sitting in a saloon. John says, that was close last night. Too close. The wolf is getting stronger. I almost couldn't force it away last night. Christine says, we've known that was coming for a while now. My curse only gets stronger with age. We're running out of time. I need the heart of darkness or next time, I don't think I'll be able to stop. John sighs. Well, with some luck, Hitoshi managed to find us a guide. He gestures to Hitoshi and Lacey O'Malley who are walking in. The two of them join them at the table. Hitoshi says, we found someone willing to take us tomorrow. He says he's a guide. Christine says that that's good. And Hitoshi says, I suppose, I don't know that I trust him. He seems like the desperate sort. And John remarks that they all are. Suddenly, another man takes a seat at their table. He's got a black duster and a matching black hat. An eye patch covers his right eye. He's an older man with sun-dried skin. We can see a pistol hangs at his hip. John says, who are you supposed to be? And the man replies, I'm William Morrison, but the people around here call me Ghost Eye. You bunch made quite the racket last night. Had me about howling at the moon. Christine goes pale and John pulls his gun from its holster and levels it at William. He says, relax, friend. You'll find no trouble from me. John lowers the gun slightly. Christine asks what he wants. And Ghost Eye says, just to warn you, your guide is going to kill you tomorrow. He always does it, buries the bodies 10 miles outside town and takes any valuables. I could take you to see it if you want. Hitoshi says, no, I'd believe it of him. I don't trust anyone of his sort. Ghost Eye says, then you're wise. I'm taking a group out tomorrow. Give me $20 a piece and you can join me in mine. John says, how do we know we can trust you? And Ghost Eye says, ask your friend there. I've taken him twice. Lacey replies, three times actually. Ghost Eye says, three times? Really? I'm losing my touch. Doshi says, $20 seems fair. I will agree to that. And Ghost Eye says, I'm glad. I hate seeing interesting men die pointless deaths. He stands and tips his hat before leaving. Christine quickly turns to John. He knew. That bit about howling at the moon, he must have seen me. John says, well, maybe he's just using a saying. No way to know for sure. Lacey, what's this guy like? Lacey says, stoic, but not a soul can deny his skill. He's the only reason I'm still breathing. 
He's nice enough and never really digs into business that isn't his. John says, see Christine? He's a dependable sort. Christine says, fine, we'll use him, but I don't trust him a bit. The next morning, we're going to see the group arrive at, at the edge of Tombstone. There they find Ghost Eye waiting with another man. Ghost Eye's going to say, now that everyone's here, I'm going to tell you how this works. You've hired me as your guide. I'm supposed to get you to the maze alive. I could very well do that, but I could just as easily fail. Half that's up to you. If you fail to listen to me, I will leave you. If you wander off, I will leave you. If I have to choose between one of you and all of you, I'll pick everyone. If you don't like the way that sounds, I invite you to take your money and leave. But everything we're going to find out in these deadlands wants to kill you. If you see anyone who is not a member of the group, do not interact with them unless I say so. Are you all clear on how this works? Uh, they nod. He says, good. Is there anyone who would like their money back? None of them say anything. He says, then let's begin. He walks towards a wagon being pulled by two horses. It's got boxes and crates and some seats for people to sit on. John leans over to Christine and says, God above and the devil below, he takes this seriously. Christine says, he's not wrong about the West. And John says, no, he's not. I've heard it's worse out West way since the quake. Christine says, don't know. I've avoided it. We watch the caravan start down a rough road. We see the sun rise until it's afternoon. Uh, we follow John and Christine walking together as a man from earlier approaches them. I don't think we've met. The name is David McCarran. What's brought you folks out west? John says, Ghost Rock. And David says, I suppose that's what's brought us all. John asks him if he's been to the maze before. And David says, no. I did my Ghost Rock mining up north till the mines ran dry. Now I'm down here. Christine says, the northern mines are dry? David says, more or less. If you don't mind me asking, what brings a woman to the west? It's a dangerous part of the world. John says, she's my wife. We're hoping to start a new life. David says, well, I hope you find luck with that. You could have picked a more orthodox place. Christine says, we're the adventurous sort. And David says, well, I wish you luck. He wanders up towards the ghost eye and starts to talk to him. Christine leans over to John and says, when did we get married? John says, hey, I saved you. I know his sort. If you weren't taken, he'd stop at nothing to get at you. Christine says, well, maybe we should get married after all this. John says, I don't believe you mean that. Teasing me is cruel, you know. And she says, I'm not teasing you. With the heart of darkness, I could control my transformations. I could be a normal person with a family, John. And he says, let's get the stone first. You can propose to me after. How do you plan on taking it anyway? Christine says, I haven't exactly figured that out yet. I figure some combinations of our skills should be enough. We've got Lacey to show us to the vault. She smiles. I should check on Hitoshi. He was never one for traveling. John says, if we're lucky, maybe he'll wander off. Christine says, and I was starting to worry about you getting along with him. I was afraid you weren't really John at all. Uh, we're going to cut the tombstone. We're going to see one of the guardian angels arrive in tombstone. He finds the epitaph burned, and we see him pick through the ruins for a while until another angel finds him. I finally named these angels. These are the same two that have been chasing our heroes since the beginning of the story. Um... The first one who was Guardian Angel 1 is now Guardian Angel Grant, and the one who was Guardian Angel 2 is now uh, Guardian Angel Rinley. So those are their names. I'll uh, be referring to them as that from now on. I figured that'll make it easier to tell them apart. Uh, the first one says, Rinley, they've already left. Uh, Rinley asks which way, and Grant replies, to the maze. Uh, Rinley says, they're coming to our territory. Why? They shouldn't be running from us. I don't like it. There's something we're missing. Grant replies, we'll catch them. We have to. We must kill any who bears ill will to the shepherd. Uh, Rinley replies, we will buy horses. They won't outpace us then. We can't let them reach the city with their lives. We see Ghost Eye lighting a fire. Hitoshi eyes him carefully. He said there are things out here that eat men. Won't a fire just bring them to us? Ghost Eye says, fire keeps off the beasts with no brains. The sort that would be willing to attack us with full force. The fire attracts the smart ones, though. Don't trust anything at night in the Deadlands. Itoshi says, I don't care for tricks. They're the weapons of cowards. Gosa says, more like the weapons of the clever. We see them cook beans and pork over the fire. John tells a funny story and laughter fills the air. You know, it's all hunky-dory, but it's cut short when a cry rings out from the darkness. Uh, a voice of a woman says, help me, help me please. An odd silence falls over the camp. David looks out towards the sound. I'm hurt. I've been shot. I need help. Please, I can see your fire. David stands up from his spot. 
We have to help her. Gusta says, there's no one out there to help. David says, I heard her. What's that supposed to mean? And Gusta says, it's no woman. Sit down, fool. Suddenly, the voice in the dark changes. No longer is it the crying of a woman. It's the wailing of a baby. The camp goes quiet. What is it? David asks. Gusta says, couldn't say for sure. There are a great many things out here that sound like men. They all want one thing, for you to come and see. As I said, the fire keeps away the dumb ones, but it brings in the smart ones. The woman didn't work, so now it's trying the child. David asks if it'll come into camp, and Ghost Eye says it could, but it won't. Too much risk for it. Critters with brains don't like risk. Get some sleep. We'll make it to the sands tomorrow. We won't have the luxury of sleep till we reach the stone. And we watch John and Christine climb into bedrolls as we hear the baby crying again. We're going to cut to the caravan the next day. We see the land they're traveling on is turned into a sandy desert. Uh, the cart moves over the sand very slowly until a wheel pops off the wagon and it crashes to the ground. Gustav begins to panic. Oh hell, I need help. We have to fix this fast. We shouldn't be out here after sundown. John, Hitoshi, and David lift the cart up and Ghost Eye slowly fixes the wheel. We'll do like a small time lapse. See the sun is getting heavier as it gets closer to the night. Once it's repaired, they're going to immediately start traveling again. We'll see Ghost Eye check his pocket watch. We're not going to make it. Lost too much time. It's going to be dark before we make it to the rock. David asks, what happens then? And Ghost Eye replies, with luck, nothing. We follow them for a while until the sun starts to set. We see their wagon is lit by lanterns. We watch Ghost Eye as he eyes nervously from side to side. His hand clings to his holstered gun. John asks Lacey what has him so jumpy. And Lacey replies, this is the dangerous part. He can't afford to stop or let his guard down. Itoshi asks why it's so dangerous, and Lacey says, Rattlers. Most don't take this path for that very reason, even though it's the fastest way. There is a risk you won't make it by sundown. Which we didn't. What's a rattler? Christine asks. Lacey says, In truth, I don't know. I've never seen one, and I'm the better for it. I know they live in the ground and hunt men who walk upon its surface. As they travel through the dark, the earth begins to shake. Ghost Eye looks startled before he calls the horses to a stop. The ground starts to shake even harder. We can see it's causing their teeth to chatter due to the intensity. And uh, that's why they call them rattlers, because it makes your bones rattle. John says, what is this, an earthquake? Lacey says, it's a rattler. Ghost Eye yells, off the wagon. Then, nobody move. Stand perfectly still. We see them jump off the wagon and stand still. The shaking grows worse. We're going to focus in on Christine. She's breathing heavily, and we see flashes of her mother being killed in the quake of 68. She's about to run out of panic when Hitoshi takes her hand. He says, you're okay, Christine. I'm here. She catches her breath and breathes deeply, just as the horses bolt. They drag the wagon out towards the desert. The shaking stops for a few moments. Suddenly, sand explodes around the wagons, and the horses vanish. We hear pained whines and screams of the horses. When the sand settles, only a single lantern is left, lighting the sand. Everything else is gone, but we can see that there's blood. The earth starts shaking again. David panics. It's coming to us. Ghost Eye says, calm down, don't run. David says, to hell with that. David makes a run for it. The rumbling of the earth intensifies as the rattler starts to chase him, then stops. The ground explodes around David as tentacles emerge from the earth. Uh, we can say he's got a lantern on his belt so we can see him lit, like see this lit by the lantern in the moonlight. Uh, the tentacles hoist him off the ground and like ensnare all around him, grabbing up his arms and his legs. He starts to fight and struggle with them, so they begin to break his bones one by one, twisting his legs off until it completely twists him around, snaps him in two, and pulls him into the earth. Uh, it's pretty graphic, and uh, blood sprays everywhere. Christine's going to go, oh hell, and try to fight from vomiting. John's going to say, what the fuck is that? And Ghost is going to say, that's a rattler. Nasty beast. We won't be able to kill it. We have to wait till sunrise. We see them standing in the sand, and we're going to do a time lapse of them trying to stand still. As the sun starts to rise, we can see that they have bags under their eyes and they're barely holding on. Ghost Eye says, they won't chase us in the morning. John says, are you sure about that? And uh, Lacey says, he's right, they don't like the daylight. And says, well that's great, because I don't know how much longer I can stand here without moving. Suddenly the rumbling starts again, then slowly fades away. After a moment, Ghost Eye takes a step, then another step. The Rattlers don't kill him. He says, it's safe. We can go. The Rattler is gone. And Christine says, along with our supplies. There's a town not too far from here, Hope Falls. We should make it to the Rocky Mesa before dark. After that, we can travel safely to it and get more supplies. 
We see them walking through the desert in a montage until they reach the rocky earth. They move through a canyon. Suddenly, Ghost Eye throws up a hand. They all stop. What is it? John asks. He reaches his hand towards his deck of cards. Hitoshi says, We're being watched. They're along the cliffs. John says, Can't catch a break. Christine asks who it is. As soon as she asks, Native Americans start to appear from along the stones and cliffs. They all carry rifles or pistols. Uh, real fast, I'm going to do a history with Bjorn section real fast. Because uh, oftentimes in pop culture, you see Native Americans presented as having like bows and arrows and stuff. But around the setting of the Wild West, and specifically Deadlands, most of them had firearms already. Um, so of course, they did use bows and arrows and tomahawks still, but uh, many, uh, especially the more warlike tribes, would have rifles and pistols, either from trading or from dead enemies. Uh, and they already knew how to use them, too, around this time. So uh, that's why my Native Americans have uh, firearms. It was a stereotype that they didn't have guns. Uh, a single Native American appears from the canyon in front of them. Ghost Eye says, nobody draws a weapon. Let me handle this. Lacey says, they must be Navajo. It's their land we travel. They're going to kill us. Ghost Eye says, they won't. I know of them. Puts his hands up in like a gesture of peace and uh, approaches the natives. Uh, he starts to speak their language. I'll say this dialogue is in Navajo. I'm not going to translate it, and I'm certainly not going to try to pronounce any of that. Uh, but you guys can use your imaginations. He says, We mean you no harm. We did not mean to cross into your territory. A rattler destroyed our wagon. The native is going to say, We saw. We know what you are, Ghost Eye. Men of your ilk are not welcome here. You have been warned before. Ghost Eye says, I know. If you know what I am, then you know not to bother me. I meant no ill will by my actions. Let us pass in peace, and you will not see me again. The native says, We do not seek war with you, but we know you can die like any man. You may pass for a toll. Ghost Eye slowly reaches into his pocket carefully and removes a small stone pendant. He carefully hands it over to the native. You know that work? He asks. The native says, I do. This will suffice. You may pass in peace, Ghost Eye. Do not tread on these lands again, or we will not be so forgiving. Ghost Eye says, I will not. The uh, group begins to move through the canyon again. We can see the natives following them along the cliff tops. John asks Ghost Eye, what did you say to him? And Ghost Eye says, I offered him a trade for our passage. John asks what he traded. And Ghost Eye says, just an old trinket, something of value only to men like me and them. They leave the canyon. We see the natives standing atop the cliffs watching them as they go. Uh, we see them walk through some plains for a while until we cut to Hope Falls. We see a waterfall flowing down to a river. A small town is built around it, sort of appearing out of the desert. Green in an oasis. You know, it's like an oasis uh, caused by a, a spring, hence the name. Electricity wires run through its streets. We pan from the city to see our weary group arriving just as the sun starts to set. Their faces are sunburned and they look haggard. A man steps out of the sheriff's office and he rides out to meet them. Ghost Eye says, stay here, I'll be right back. He walks up and meets the man. Uh, this guy's named Leonard Cave. He's tall and handsome in a sort of rugged way. He wears a sheriff badge on his shirt and a pair of pistols at his waist. He sort of looks like your stereotype lawman in these movies. The good guy, you know. Leonard says, Ghost Eye, it's good to see you. And uh, Ghost Eye replies, how have you been, Leonard? Leonard Cave says, oh, you know, hanging on. He looks past Ghost Eye to his caravan. More sorry saps headed for the maze. Ghost Eye says, something like that. Leonard nods his head. He says, you look like hell. Ghost Eye says, lost a wheel in the sand. Rattler almost killed us all. Leonard says, you're lucky to be alive, old friend. Ghost Eye says, oh, I know. Lost one to the beast. Leonard says, sorry to hear it. Ghost Eye says, he knew the danger. Leonard says, how long are you going to be in town? Ghost Eye says, just a night or two. Time enough to recover and buy supplies. You got hotel rooms for us? Leonard says, the old cracked mesa should have rooms. All the miners have gone Sheltonville way since the railroad came. We'd be a ghost town if it weren't for that mad doctor and his electricity. Ghost Eye says, well, I'll bring some business your way. And Leonard says, I appreciate it. Ghost Eye signals the caravan into town. We follow John as he studies the town. We see a toy shop with animatronic toys in the window and a big power plant being powered by a wheel in the river. Uh, John says, this is something else. Christine says, sure is. I wouldn't have thought to see electricity this far out. Ghost Eye says, a man named Aldo Deringer bring, builds it all himself. He's trying to make a name for himself as an engineer. John says, well, he picked the ass end of nowhere to do it. Ghost Eye says, this used to be the ghost rock capital of Arizona. All the ghost rock from the maze came through here. Christine asks what happened. 
Ghost Eye says, Railroad's chose another town. And it became the Trade Center instead. A man in front of a saloon gets up and approaches them as soon as he sees them. His name is Carlos uh, Alonzo. Uh, he's a character from one of the modules. Carlos says, have you come down Texas way? John says, no, friend. Tombstone, and before that, Kansas. Do you have any word of Santa Ana? Carlos asks. Has he taken back San Antonio from the Texans? John says, not that I've heard. Christine says, he hasn't. He's still down in Mexico, or so the papers say. Carlos says, he's biding time and building his strength. Santa Ana is a hero. He's going to bring peace to these lawless lands. John says, I doubt it. There's no law to be had out here. The man makes a stink face at him, you know, not very happy about that, and stops and lets the party move on. John spares a look back for him. The man just stares and studies John right back. Uh, the sun sets and the electric lights of the city flicker to life. They arrive at the inn. An old woman sits on the porch lit by a light. She says, come in before the electric man gets you. She laughs to herself as though she said something really funny. She notices Ghost Eye and says, Ghost Eye, it's good to see you. I thought you were dead. Ghost Eye says, not yet, I'm afraid. I need a couple of rooms, whatever's cheapest. The woman says, that's all the rooms these days. Come on in, I'll get you folks situated. Uh, they follow her into the old building, and it's lit by electric lights like everything in this town. She says, the lady can have this room, as she gestures to one of the doors. Uh, then she turns to Ghost Eye. You take that one there, gesturing to another door. She walks a bit further and says, and you three can share this one. Hitoshi, John, and Lacey walk into the room. We see one bed, a chair, and a couch. Uh, Hitoshi says, I'm taking the bed before anyone can say anything. He puts his stuff down on it. We're going to cut to Christine's room. There's a knock at her door and she goes to answer it. We see John standing there. He holds up a deck of cards. Want to play a game of cards? I'd like to talk. She says sure and invites him in. They sit on the floor. John pulls out his card deck and deals their hands. They're going to play a game of poker. John says, nice place, huh? Sarcastically. Christine smiles. I found more than a few insects already, but it's an improvement over the last couple of days. John said, about anything would be, I reckon. Christine looks at her cards. I'll raise. She slides a coin between them. John grimaces, and I'll fold. He tosses his cards into the center, revealing a trash hand. He starts shuffling the deck and dealing again. Christine says, what did you want to talk about? What you said before, about family. Did you mean it? Christine said, I did. If I can ever be normal, well, all I've ever wanted is to have a family again, to restore what I lost. John asks her if there would be a place for him in it. She looks him in the eyes and says, of course, and that she regrets leaving him and that she missed him. John says that the feeling was mutual and that uh, almost dying today put things in perspective for him, and that he wants to set things right before he dies. Christine says that she doesn't want him to die at all and that maybe they should just leave things as are if that's how it's going to be. Uh, John tells her that they played that out once and where's the fun in that now? And then he leans in and kisses her and we cut away. We're going to see the group leaving Hope Falls. Ghost Eye says, won't be long now. The maze is only a few days away. That's where the really difficult part begins. Crossing the mesas is no easy task. John says, great. At least we have something to look forward to. We're going to cut to the guardian angels. They enter Hope Falls, just on the heels of our heroes. The people watch them nervously. We see Leonard Cave right up to meet them. He says, welcome, gentlemen. What brings the lost angels here? Uh, Guardian Angel Grant says, we're looking for a devil worshiper, a gambler by the name of John Weber. He's joined up with a black-haired woman. Have you seen them? Leonard says, can't say that I've seen anyone like that. Sounds mem memorable enough. I think I'd remember. Guardian Angel Grant narrows his eyes and thumbs the gun in his waist. Are you sure? Leonard says, I reckon I am. And Rindley says, well, says very well, then we're just passing through. They move past Leonard into the town. Grant turns to Rinley. He's lying to us. And Rinley says, Oh, I know. And he will pay soon. But we have no need for him. We see them continue until Carlos approaches them. Rinley says, Carlos, we're looking for a man who carries cards and a woman with dark hair. Did they come from Tombstone in Kansas before that? Carlos asks. Rinley says, They did. And Carlos says, Then I've seen him. Left this morning not long past sunrise. Traveling with old Ghost Eye and Lacey O'Malley, too. I recognized him from the papers. Guardian Angel Grant says, The newsman? He should already be dead. And Carlos says, Well, he's not. Rinley says, You did well, Carlos. Hold your post. Your call will be soon. Carlos says, For the shepherd. And Rinley says, For the flock. Uh, we see Carlos start to yell loudly so the bystanders can hear. Tell me, friends, what word do you have of Santa Ana? Which way have you come? Rinley says, I'm afraid not. He's still in Mexico. 
Carlos says, he's gonna come clean up this country, you'll see. He'll spread order and law in God's image. Ridley says, we'll see. We're gonna see all the main characters around a campfire as the sun starts to set. John and Christine are holding hands, Hitoshi is sharpening his blade, and Lacey is trying to read by the firelight. The camera pulls out until we're focusing on a hill a bit away. We see the two guardian angels are perched on the hill. One has odd ghost rock binoculars that steam. Grant says, your man was good, as he looks through the binoculars. Lacey O'Malley is with them. Rinley says, an unexpected windfall for us. I don't see the guide he called Ghost Eye, unless he's the one with the sword. Rinley says, he must be. We'll wait for them to sleep. Kill the gambler first and the rest will die easily enough. Suddenly, we're going to hear a gruff voice behind them. You two, why are you following my group? The two angels turn around just in time to see Ghost Eye Morrison standing behind them. Rinley says, you travel with a devil worshipper. He uses tainted magic and playing cards. Ghost Eye says, devil worshipper, huh? And what do you know of the devil? You think that boy back there knows the devil? Someone as weak as him? The guardian angels take a step back as a supernatural green fog begins to cover the night. Ghost Eye removes his eye patch slowly, and we can see that he has an eye beneath it. It's a cat's eye, and it glows bright yellow. Guardian Angel Grant says, You're one of them! A friend of hell! Ghost Eye says, I've seen the devil, and he's a lot more frightening than that boy, and he's much more frightening than you. Grant draws his gun and fires a bullet in the Ghost Eye's chest. A small amount of blood trickles from it. Ghost Eye laughs. Grant fires two more shots, both hit him in the chest. Ghost Eye doesn't even react. You think that will save you now? Ghost Eye pulls his own pistol in a blur of motion. It has odd machinery worked all around it. He fires it and puts a bullet through the angel's head. We see his gun glows with blue smoke, and you can hear whispers of the dead through the curling smoke. I'll say you can see little faces appear in the smoke as though like there's dying souls inside of it. Rinley puts his hands up as soon as his compatriot hits the ground. My friend there was a fool. Too new to this to understand the truth of all this. Look, I just want the gambler and the newsman. Let me take them quick and quiet. I'll pay you well. You'll have no more trouble from me or mine. Ghost Eye says, not interested. I'm warning you. I know what you are, and I want no part in this. Wait till they're not in my care before taking them. Follow me again, and you'll be a corpse like your friend. Then you'll really get to meet the devil. And trust me, friend. He's gonna love you. I'll be taking your horses. Ghost Eye turns away and slides his eye patch back on. He takes the horses with no resistance from the angel as we hear the song Death Comes Riding by the Twisted Hillbillies start to play. And that's where I'm going to end episode three. Uh, we had quite a bit happen in this episode. Uh, we got introduced to Ghost Eye and then we quickly realized that he's not everything he seems to be. There's something off with him. <laughs> Maybe very off. Uh, we also got to see Hope Falls, a location in a couple modules um, and some characters there. We got to see uh, our first look at the Deadlands and some of the monsters that inhabit them. And we got some good character building stuff. We got to see the Native Americans too, who are a big part of Deadlands lore, um, which I have not tapped into too often in this particular series. And that's for good reason. I think I want to save the Native American stuff for the season two of this if I write it. And they just didn't really fit into this story I'm particularly telling here in the world. Uh, that being said, we will see the Native Americans uh, more in the sequel series if I write it, and they are very important to Deadlands. So I thought it would be fun to just kind of give us a little peek here. Hey, thanks for watching, folks. I just want to thank everyone again for all the uh, for all the love I'm getting on this channel. It means a lot to me, and uh, so yeah, I uh, hope to see you all in the next one.